Good afternoon. This is the Thurston County Board of Health um, for uh, September 12, 2017. I'm Commissioner Bud Blake, the chair of the Board of Health this year. I'd like to start off by doing introductions. To my left is Mr. Gary uh, Edwards, uh, Commissioner Gary Edwards. To my right is Commissioner John Hutchins. To his right is Lydia, Hush Hutchinson, Lydia Hutchinson, the clerk of the board. And to her right is Shelley Slaughter, the uh, Director of Public Health and Social Services. To her right is uh, Dr. Wood, the health director, health officer for Lewis and Thurston County. And to her right is the county manager, Romero Chavez. With that in mind, I'll call the meeting to order and see if there's an approval or, uh, for the agenda today. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the agenda of the Board of Health for Tuesday, September 12, 2017. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda for September 12, 2017. All those in favor say aye. 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 And that motion, aye, and that motion carries. Is there approval, a minute, uh, approval for the minutes for 11 July and for August 8, 2017? Uh, I move for the approval of the meeting minutes from July 11, 2017 and August 8, 2017. Second. We moved and seconded to approve the minutes for 11 July 2017 and August 8, 2017. All those in favor say aye. 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 And so that motion carries also. So the first item we have as far as an action item is some proclamations. We want to make awareness of several different um, items that are going on, prostate cancer, National Recovery Month, and World Suicide. And I'll start off by doing the uh, prostate cancer proclamation and ask that Shelly is going to lead it off, and then we'll <coughs> ask Mr. Donaldson to come up and say a few words. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, yes, we are asking today for you to proclaim it to Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. There are an estimated 180,000 case, new cases of prostate cancer nationally and an estimated 26,000 deaths each year. That's one in seven men who will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime, and this is entirely preventable. So we would like to raise awareness in Thurston County um, so that we have more men that um, can monitor and prevent prostate cancer in their lives. Uh, the Washington State Prostate Cancer Coalition, together with the Thurston County Chapter of US2 International, support prostate cancer awareness in Thurston County with programs and educational materials. And today we have Mr. Donaldson, who's here to accept the proclamation um, on behalf of those organizations that advocate for prostate cancer awareness in our community. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Hi, Donaldson. Hi. Hello, sir. How are you doing? It's good to see you again. Yeah, step up to the mic and tell us a little bit how you've been advocating for the last couple of years that I know of and some of the things that you've been in, uh, instrumental in. Thank you, and good afternoon to all of you. Hey, can I you do a head. small I favor and pull the mic up just a tad? Yeah, there you I go. Am. Yes, there All right, go. now then, go ahead. How's that? You got the floor. Go ahead. All right, thank you. So thanks to, to you for acknowledging uh, prostate cancer in the month of September, which is the, the National Prostate Cancer Month. I think this is about the sixth year that you all have done that, mm -hmm. and it's been a, a significant uh, thing for the organization, and let me tell you just a little bit about the organization. Us2 International is based in Chicago. It's all volunteer work. We have a, uh, a subsidiary of that here in Olympia. We're very fortunate to have Mr. Jim Kiefert, who's the former chairman, just happens to live here. Oh, great. And so, we meet the third Tuesday of uh, every month at uh, room 202 in St. Peter's Hospital. And uh, it is a very informal, casual organization designed to help men newly, newly diagnosed or their spouses who are concerned about uh, the variety of options that are available today for people in that position. So um, the deaths from this have declined somewhat. Uh, and part of that is because of the issue over PSA, which is the, uh, I think most people are aware of, the doctors now have said, you know, really don't need that. That is really the only way that you can, primary way that you can find prostate cancer. Like other cancers, it's a, um, a silent cancer. Mm -hmm. So the issue becomes awareness. So what you're doing today, what you've done in the past, uh, we're great, very grateful for because there will be people who will be made aware of this, who will check into it, who will request a PSA, and may find they have an issue and have an opportunity to get it corrected. So on behalf of us two international <coughs> and its local chapter, uh, we say thank you. Yeah, don't step away. Uh, I think you might have a question. I, I, do. Mm -hmm. I do have a question. Could you give me the date that you have those meetings? You said at room 202 yes. at St. Peter's. Yes, it is the third Tuesday, Commissioner, of, the, of every month. 
we have speakers who come in and talk about it, sometimes doctors, sometimes people who've been involved in the process. And uh, it is, uh, starts at 7 o'clock, and it, uh, we start on time, just like you folks. We start on time, we end on time. <laughs> 7 a.m.? 7 p.m. 7, oh, 7 p.m. Yeah, until, uh, until 8.30. And uh, if someone was interested in going, would they have a number to call? Do they need to make a arrangement ahead don't, of time? They don't need to do anything. They, if you uh, check the concierge desk at St. Peter's Hospital, they can direct the person right to, uh, to that uh, room, which is on the second floor next to the cafeteria. Okay. And i uh, love to have anybody show up who has an interest, has a loved one who has a problem, or just thinks they might, they might have an issue. Thank you very much great, for your great. work on this. And thank, thanks to you folks. You've been a great help and great assistance. Yeah, Mom, uh, do you have a question? And thank sure. you for coming today and, uh, and supporting this as well. And great. Bring it great. My pleasure. The work you do. All right. Thanks to all of you. Yeah, I have one question. So uh, you said it kind of um, fast, and I want to make sure everybody here. It's uh, us two, can you, right? And can you spell that out, walk yes, that out, what that is? Yes, it's us two mm -hmm. uh, international, which uh, is similar to the uh, breast cancer organization. The mm -hmm. only difference is they're well organized, and they've got a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And they're more than willing to talk about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guys just have a hard time talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's U.S. in the U.S. Sense of, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. not like United States, but U.S. U.S. T O O. Yep. Right. And so, how, how could one find uh, information out uh, to go to the website? They are on the web. They are on the web, and um, uh, I can send a link to uh, La Bonita um, oh, sure. in the event that anybody else wants to get in contact with the local organization as well. That was a good. Um, a, a good question that was asked. Yeah, sure. And did, I didn't hear it because I was taking a note, but did you, can you repeat when you meet here locally at St. Pete's? And it, it is the third Tuesday of each month, mm -hmm. and um, it's uh, from 7 o'clock until 8.30. Sure. And, and 202, room 202. Sure. The last thing, and I'll quit bugging you, uh, nope, for nope. those guys, like you said, that yeah. don't want to talk about it, what sure. kind of advice do you have for uh, people, men or women, whatever, to get out there and get involved when they are uh, that involved or a loved one of sure. them involved? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Wonderful question. Sure. Wonderful question. So one of the things that we found is this is um, – uh, clinically, w w there's so much going on and so many new things that are coming down the pike that many, uh, many doctors are really not able to keep, keep up on all of this. So I, I think the best thing that I could suggest to somebody, and I do it all the time, is to come to that monthly meeting, uh, get involved in that organization, find out what other people have done, what they're doing, what not to do. Mm -hmm. um, That's what I'm talking as about. A, as a prostate cancer survivor myself, mm -hmm. I wish I had been to this group beforehand, I would have done a lot of things differently. Uh -huh. And that's, that's really the key, I think. Mm -hmm. So I lied. Uh, tell me about how many people come uh, each month. So that Well, we I have did. about 350 people who are on the uh, emailing list, sure. and we probably have uh, uh, 25 to 30, depending. If we have, a, we have speakers from the University of Washington, guys who are scientists uh, who um, spend their whole life working on trying to, uh, to resolve these issues. Then we get a pretty good crowd. Mm -hmm. We also have some months that are just a round table where you get the guys who are there struggling with this issue who talk about you know, what they're going through and, um, and trying new things because there's so much that's happening in this mm -hmm. right now. This is just amazing. The, 40 years ago, the same treatment plan, uh, which was hormone deprivation, was used until about 1995. Wow. And now there's a plethora of new drugs and things that are, that are out there. So, so innovative and hope. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the absence of hope um, is something that, that really will put you in the, in the toilet real quick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely. So uh, this is a spirited group of people who have fought the battle and are winning and are eager to help others. Yeah, so I've been here. This is my third year, and, sir, you are one of my heroes for keeping coming here every year and doing this for us. Yeah, so thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Commissioner Hutchins to read a proclamation for you. And I just want to re I won't repeat it, but ditto. <laughs> ditto on what Commissioner uh, Thank you so much. Blake said, too, about the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas the American Cancer Society has been dedicated to supporting cancer research, education, advocacy, and patient services since May 22, 1913, 
And whereas prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in men, and whereas there are an estimated 180,890 cases, new cases of prostate cancer nationally in 2016, and an estimated 26,120 deaths from prostate cancer in the same period. One in seven men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer within his lifetime. And whereas there are an estimated 4,820 men diagnosed with prostate cancer in Washington State last year, and an estimated 630 deaths from prostate cancer. And Whereas the Washington State Prostate Cancer Coalition, together with the Thurston County Chapter of Us Two International, support prostate cancer awareness in Thurston County with programs and educational materials through their respective organizations to encourage all men to have an informed discussion with their health care provider about prostate cancer by the age of 50 and by 45 if they have a family history of the disease. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Thurston County Board of Health does hereby proclaim the month of September as Prostate Cancer Awareness Month and hereby expresses its gratitude to the Washington State Prostate Cancer Coalition and the Thurston County Chapter of Us Two International for their effort to encourage all men to be aware of the disease and to provide education and support to men in Thurston County afflicted with the prostate cancer. Adopted this 12th day of September 2017, Board of Health. Yay. Yay. Thank, Thank you very much. You, you will help save lives. Thank you. So I wonder if I can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, the next proclamation is the National Recovery Month. Do you have the lead on on that one too, Kim? Yes, I'm also here to ask you to proclaim September National Recovery Month and join the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy on proclaiming it National Recovery Month and raising awareness of those impacted by um, drug and alcohol abuse and encouraging those who need treatment to um, access recovery and those who have relatives or friends that are struggling with alcohol or substance abuse issues um, to, to, to get treatment and support their recovery efforts. Uh, just a few local statistics here in Thurston County. We have an average of 34 county residents each year that die of alcohol-related deaths, 19 that are opioid-related, and 33 that are other drug-related. And I know that um, Arthur's and County Coroner is here in the audience today, and he can attest to the tragic effect that this has on, on many families, um, including my own. So I've had several relatives in my family that have struggled with drugs and alcohol and um, have lost their lives to it. So I encourage everyone um, in our viewing audience um, and in the room here today to, um, to join us in this proclamation for national recovery. Okay. Any comments or questions? Are we going to hear anything from any of the folks in the audience? On this know? one, we don't have a person oh. per se, but okay. in terms of <coughs> okay. the audience, the audience on this. No, good to go. Just Thank you. Lot, so. <laughs> okay, sure. Go ahead and read the And this is something that affects and impacts more Everybody. people than will admit. Uh, mm -hmm. Almost every every family is touched somehow by someone with, uh, with addiction. Uh, whereas behavioral health is an essential part of health, and one's overall wellness, and whereas prevention of substance abuse disorders works, treatment is effective, and people recover in our area and around the nation, and whereas preventing and overcoming substance abuse disorders is essential to achieving healthy lifestyles, both physically and emotionally, and whereas we must encourage relatives and friends of people with substance abuse disorders to implement preventative measures recognize the signs of a problem, and guide those in need of appropriate treatment and recovery support service. And whereas, Thurston County Board of Health calls upon all citizens, parents, governmental agencies, public and private institutions,
businesses, hospitals, schools, and colleges in Thurston County to support this year's Recovery Month theme, which is Join Voices, Join the Voices for Recovery, Strengthen Families and Communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Thurston County Board of Health joins the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy hereby proclaim September 2017 uh, National Recovery Month in Thurston County, adopted this 12th day of September 2017, your Board of Health. Thank you. Fantastic. And hope. <laughs> Doing that we're going to hear about hope. We're going to hear about oh, hope. We're going to hear about lead later. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move to the next proclamation, which is World Suicide Prevention Month. And I think you have a lead in, and then we'll ask uh, the coroner to come up, and then we'll have Commissioner Hutchins read a proclamation. Yes, so Sunday, September 10th, was World Suicide Prevention Day, and September is World Suicide Prevention Month. And unfortunately, we also have many people in our community in Thurston County that are affected by suicide, which is also completely preventable. Suicide is the eighth leading cause of death for Thurston County residents. On average, there are 44 Thurston County residents that die each year from suicide, and we don't want anyone to have their life cut short because they do not have the mental health support or the support of their community, um, and we want them to know that there is help out there. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, Thurston County Coroner Gary Warnock to come up and accept the proclamation, and perhaps you want to share a few words with us. Commissioners, good afternoon. Pull the mic down oh, just a tad. There you go. Better? Welcome, coroner. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, suicides are, are difficult cases to work, and um, they're really not publicized in our general media. Um, I'm a survivor of suicide. Uh, the only time that the media really gets a hold of a suicide case is if it's done in a public setting. So all the other suicides that have occurred are generally behind doors, and the general public doesn't hear about those. Um, so just as for numbers, just for Thurston County alone, uh, last year we had 53 suicides. Uh, this year, this time last year, we were at 34 and already we're at 45. So we're on track to probably uh, exceed 60 suicides just uh, this year. Um, and I, I told Commissioner Blake uh, this morning that since uh, September 1st, we've already had eight. Wow. Um, <clears throat> any telltale signs of how this all happens and just what you've seen over in, in, is it veterans, is it women, is it a certain age group, just the, demo the, the demographics of it, does it lead to one or the other or is it just? I can, I'm going to go off last year's numbers mm -hmm. because that was a, a completed year. Uh, average age was 46 years old mm -hmm. and the uh, breakdown uh, as far as uh, gender was almost 50-50. Uh, we are seeing more females use firearms uh, mm -hmm. in our society because they're being more, they're more familiar with um, guns. I mean, you're finding more female hunters and everything else, but we're finding more, more females using firearms uh, to make, uh, commit suicide. Uh, the economy, uh, we were seeing a lot of veterans back when the war was uh, really um, pushing the numbers, but we've seen that kind of decline. Mental health. That's where I was going next. Okay. Yeah, mental health. And uh, use of drugs. Mm -hmm. Drugs. Mm -hmm. Drugs and alcohol. Uh, access to firearms. Um, family issues mm -hmm. uh, was the case of our murder-suicide just recently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's sure. pretty much it. Very impactful, yeah. How about you, Adam? <coughs> just unfortunate that all of our proclamations this, today, I bet there's nobody out here in the viewing audience or here today that hasn't been affected by one of these. Very important. Well, you any comments? <clears throat> yes. You said we've had eight suicides since September 1, and we haven't even been a full two weeks into this month yet. No. And it's interesting, we're talking about numbers, eight in 12 days, and we're talking about um, pre uh, prevention month, suicide prevention month, and yet it is so devastating to those families with the ripple effect, with families and friends and even neighbors of the school, friends and school kids throughout the community, uh, and that's a ripple effect that, no, that nobody gets over that. 
No, they they'll never. be forever. We'll, we'll talk numbers eight and two weeks time, and okay, let's let's talk about prevention. But it it is it, it's shocking. It really is, and it goes back to what I just said on the earlier proclamation about hope, the theory of hope that um, uh, prosecuting attorney John Thunheim speaks highly of and um, consistently on, um, and it's. I just can't imagine, and most people I don't think can imagine what it is to feel. I've felt helpless before, but I've never actually been hopeless. And to have that feeling or to be that person where it feels like someone has taken the plug from the bottom of the earth out and all the colors run out, I can't imagine that kind of uh, despair. can't imagine it. So it's very powerful and, like I say, very, very personal, obviously, and, and it can't be prevented in some instances, sure. not always. Anyway, that's all I have to say. No, there's a lot of resources out there for people to reach out a to. Tremendous you. amount of resources out there. Mm -hmm. Tremendous amount. And uh, I'm not going to get misty-eyed because I'm too detached from uh, right. uh, from life to care. I just don't think we, we we will ever be able to do enough. No, we won't. No. And I'm, I'm being facetious because I do care. I'm ready to read it. I'm ready for you to read Let's it. Let's do it. All right. Whereas all people deserve the opportunity to live healthy, a healthy, rewarding life, and whereas suicide is the eighth leading cause of death for Thurston County residents, and whereas on average 44 Thurston County residents die each year from suicide, and whereas no one individual should have their potential limited, have their life cut short, or be deprived of their fullest measure of happiness, because they do not have the mental health support that they need. And whereas, uh, as members of communities, it is our responsibility to look out for those who may be struggling, check in with them, and encourage them to tell their story in their own way and at their own pace, offering a gentle word of support and listening in a non-judgmental way can make all the difference. And whereas on this day we affirm our belief that mental health is an essential part of overall health and together we renew our commitment to supporting and empowering all to seek the care they need. And whereas 2017 marks the 15th World Suicide Prevention Day, September 10th, an initiative of the International Association for Suicide Prevention and endorsed by the World Health Organization, Whereas the board calls upon all citizens, parents, governmental agencies, public and private institutions, businesses, hospitals, schools, and colleges in Thurston County to support this year's World Suicide Prevention Day theme, take a minute, change a life, and join with others around the world who are working towards the common goal of preventing suicide. Now, therefore, be it resolved the Thurston County Board of Health does hereby proclaim September 2017 World Suicide Prevention Month in Thurston County, adopted this 12th day of September 2017, Board of Health. All right. I'd like to present you and all those out there who are involved in, in prevention in some sort of way, or at least helping families. You, yeah. Anybody out there? <laughs> Come on. It's okay. Come on. I would just like to add a word about resources. Sure. If there's anyone that is considering suicide or struggling with depression and just needs someone to talk to, they can call 24-7 the Thurston Mason Crisis Clinic. And that number is 360-586-2000. Is, uh, People may also, just on their phones, from any phone, dial 211, and they'll be connected with someone that can um, inform them of all the local resources that can support them. And of course, um, always call 911 if um, your uh, life is in danger or you're afraid that a loved one's is. You Thank you. Thank you. There is uh, help out there. Is 211, Shelley, is 211 for all resources or just suicide specific? All resources, so that would also apply to our other proclamations as well today for anyone that may be struggling with um, substance abuse or alcohol-related issues and are looking for some community resources and some support. Yeah. Great 2 question. 1 -1. Thank yeah. you. 2 -1 -1.
All righty, we're going to move on in the agenda here. And item number three is the opportunity for the public to address the Board of Health. And I'm going to, I don't have a sign sheet, but I'm just going to ask anybody in the public if they'd like to come forward to the podium and speak to the Board of Health. Seeing no hands or anybody indicating, we'll just go on to item number four, which is departmental items. And we have uh, Gretchen Toller, who's going to talk a little bit about the approval of amendment to a contract for Lewis County Nurse Family Partnership. Hello, Gretchen. How are you doing, Anne? Hi, Commissioners. Thank you for having me. You bet. Um, so I am the supervisor for the Nurse Family Partnership Program at Thurston County Public Health, and I am seeking approval for an amendment to our Lewis County Supervisor Services contract today that you had approved earlier this year. And this amendment is strictly to extend the, the contract time through the end of the year, through December 31st. Okay. Any questions for Gretchen? No, but I would like to thank her and her group for all the hard work that they do. And, you know, you've probably heard me say this before, but kids are 30% of our population and 100% of our future, and we better get it right. Thank you. We, we appreciate your support. How about you? And I love the work you all do. Yeah. Thank oh, you. you bet. Uh, the work you all do, just elaborate a little bit about the Nurse Family Partnership and how Thurston County is being involved with Lewis County just for a second. I'm sorry, say it one more Just time. to elaborate oh. a little bit on the okay. contract and um, how it relates back to Lewis County and Thurston County as so, far as their family um, partnership. So we are partnering with Lewis County. They are without a nurse family partnership supervisor, so I've been providing supervision to their um, two nurses. Actually, it's just one nurse now uh -huh. um, since I, th I think this was approved in March. So mm -hmm. we've been doing that, and um, sh they attend our team meetings and work with our team. It's a great partnership. So... They're learning a lot about Thurston County. We're learning a lot about Lewis County, and we're thrilled about the partnership. It's working well. So Sure. And specifically, the Nurse Family Partnership, give a, just a 30-second minute overview of what that means and what it does. So it's an evidence-based home visiting program. We work with first-time pregnant moms, um, although we are starting our pilot project of serving moms that are um, that it's not just their first pregnancy, so beyond their first pregnancy. And we visit with them until their baby turns two. In the, in the home. So we work on a lot of goals, motivational interviewing, um, support them and walk walk that path with them as they become parents and um, it's very successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So. All right. Is there mm -hmm. anything else? No? Oh, yeah. Dr. White, sure. As the health officer of both counties, I'm <laughs> just delighted. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. We are too. Is there a motion? Mr. Chair, I move to approve and sign an amendment to the Lewis County Nurse Family Partnership Supervisory Services Contract extending the time period to September 1, 2017 through December 31, 2017. Second. It's been moved and seconded as stated. All those in favor say aye. 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 And so your motion carries. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Gretchen. You bet. So the next department item is number five, and it's the Thurston Thrives Action Team highlight on the criminal justice specifically. So we have the prosecuting attorney, John, Mr. John Thunheim, and Ann Larson. Are you coming up, Ann, or just in case? And there he's going to tell you about the LEAD program. <laughs> okay, she's got your back. Okay. So talk and to uh, us about LEAD, LEAD. There is a PowerPoint. Somewhere out there. That we need to launch. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to touch the comp uh, no, computer. No, don't do that. Don't. <laughs> Wise move. Orange. Oh, thanks. Ta da. No. You got it right. There you go. Yep. There you go. Law enforcement assisted diversion. There you go. <coughs> Well, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is John Thunheim. I'm the prosecuting attorney, and uh, I'm here to try to give you a very quick overview over what is commonly called LEAD, which is an acronym that stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. And before I dive into the PowerPoint, I'm just going to give you just a very quick um, history about uh, this project and about how it ties to Thurston Thrive so that people have relevance to this as we start talking about it. Uh, as you uh, may know, uh, when Thurston Thrives was originally started, it did not involve any aspect of public safety. 
Uh, but over the months uh, that uh, Thurston Thrives was uh, really starting up and starting to get going, it became very evident to everybody involved that public health and public safety are really inextricably intertwined. The, the two really go hand in hand. And so after some uh, discussion and thought, uh, public safety was added to the Thurston Thrives initiative. Um, and instead of creating a new action team, uh, which is uh, the model that Thurston Thrive uses in other areas, we simply adopted a group that had been meeting for a couple of years, longer than that actually, called the Law and Justice Council. So the Law and Justice Council is, serves as the action team for the Thurston Thrives, what's now known as the Public Safety and Justice Action Team. Uh, as part of our strategy, one of our goals was to um, reduce uh, penetration into the criminal justice system for those who really didn't belong in the criminal justice system. In other words, to try to cr find ways to prevent people from getting caught up in the criminal justice system who really didn't need to be in that system. This really goes to the heart of criminal justice reform, which is about trying to connect systems together better so that the right people end up in the right system for what they need and what will make the community safer ultimately. And of course, one of the biggest issues has always been mental health and behavioral health systems. For uh, as long as I've been a prosecutor, which I'm getting pretty close to 30 years now, uh, these systems have not worked together or talked together. Uh, but this has really taken a profound change, especially in Thurston County over the last uh, five, uh, five or six years. Uh, and the relationship that has developed between criminal justice and public health is, I think, very unique in this county. And this uh, Thurston Thrives Initiative uh, demonstrates that. Uh, so the project that was endorsed by the Law and Justice Council to further this is the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion uh, Project. Um, and of course, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't even read the, the slide. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of LEAD and then just kind of how it works. That is helpful. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, LEAD is actually a program that was developed in Seattle in response to a significant problem with street level drug dealing in the Belltown area. Uh, just open air drug dealing and uh, the frustration on the part of law enforcement, uh, criminal defense, uh, the entire justice system, but also uh, behavioral health systems and so forth in an inability to get a handle on this. So they created this diversion system which basically gives police officers on the street the ability to make a decision at that level about whether somebody needed to go to jail or whether they could instead be offered to be connected to addiction or behavioral health services. Uh, and uh, that started up as a pilot program in Seattle and admittedly it was somewhat controversial and, and rather paradigm shifting for law enforcement to think that they were going to arrest somebody and take them to somewhere else other than the county jail or the city jail. And a lot of skepticism. Uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, we in Thurston County were kind of watching this program develop and uh, admittedly I was one of those skeptics. I was kind of watching it develop to see if it could actually work and the University of Washington was um, asked to do a study uh, of its effectiveness and about two years ago the numbers came out and really, really caught everybody's attention with significant reductions in recidivism uh, for people who entered into and participated in the LEAD program. I don't recall exactly what those numbers were, but it's in the order of 50% less. Uh -huh. uh, so it's, it's a significant reduction in recidivism, and that's really um, made it a, a, a viable uh, public safety strategy. The way this works is when the officer uh, is on the street and has um, contacted and potentially arrested somebody on probable cause, that they've committed a certain type of crime, and it needs to be an eligible crime under the lead criteria, so this isn't every crime or any crime. It's very specific crimes, mostly dealing with what we might refer to as nuisance crimes. Those are crimes that, are, that often law enforcement finds themselves dealing with, with folks who are in crisis or experiencing mental illness. Um, 
or uh, small, low-level drug possession crimes. Um, so possession of personal use amounts of controlled substances. Uh, and if the officer, um, in dealing with that person, really uh, determines that there is, uh, th th that this person should, is better uh, served if they were to be referred and plugged into some services as opposed to being booked, they can make that referral directly uh, to uh, the mental health professionals uh, at the street level as a, what we call a warm handoff. In our county, <clears throat> I'm going to skip through some of these slides to get to the heart of it. In our county, um, the issue was we, ha we have the, we can develop the protocol, but who are we going to connect these people to? Where, where do they go? And how do we fund that? Well, then lo and behold, here comes the Behavioral Health Organization, otherwise known as the BHO, and uh, some of the Medicaid money that it now manages. And, and says, wouldn't it be a good use of this money to be able to connect these people into addiction services or mental health services and divert them out of the criminal justice system? And from that, a program under the BHO uh, was created called Mobile Outreach. And these are uh, mental health, behavioral health case management folks that are out there basically working on the street. That became the other end of lead for us in Thurston County. So now a law enforcement officer uh, in Thurston County who has arrested somebody for an eligible crime can basically call the mobile outreach unit, have them come out. There is a, a, a discussion and a decision about whether this person might be appropriate for a lead program and lead services. And if the decision is yes, then that handoff occurs potentially right there on the street. The law enforcement officer uh, uh, basically hands custody over to the case manager who engages and starts to enroll that person potentially into services. As long as that person engages, we don't even require them to complete anything or to get all the way through or graduate from anything. As long as they engage uh, and go through the intake process, then we agree uh, not to to proceed with a prosecution. And so that's the incentive for them to engage in, in this particular process. The case management services that are being provided uh, through the BHO uh, potentially are these. Employment, social, secur social security, housing, counseling, medication, uh, medical care, in, in other words, primary care, transportation, and intensive case management. That can also include um, uh, outpatient uh, uh, drug treatment and or uh, mental health uh, treatments as well. There's a map here uh, just to show you that LEAD is really now a national trend across the country. This map gives you just uh, uh, an idea of how this has spread across the country from Seattle. Um, uh, m moving outwards uh, and recently was endorsed by the uh, White House as a either a, a best practice or a promising best practice uh, in uh, law enforcement uh, diversion programs. And John, for the people that were yes. seeing it on, on camera or at, at home, can you explain the, t the color differentiation then? I'm going to ask on the Anne map. to come up and tell me what the difference was. She knows that map much better than I It had the key I at do. the bottom, but it was cut off the color. Launching and operating. Um, so active lead jurisdictions right now are Baltimore, Atlanta, Fayetteville, um, Albany, Santa Fe, Portland, and Seattle. And Portland just launched theirs earlier this year, so it would be an interesting location to go down to and see how they're, they're doing. Um, all of these jurisdictions um, address lead differently. In Atlanta, it's all social referral, so that means um, 
that uh, the lead participants are um, brought in, um, suggested by law enforcement. There doesn't need to be an arrest that happens. Law enforcement says, I walk by this person every day. Um, they really need help, and so it's a social <laughs> referral into the process. Um, where our model is based more off Seattle, where law enforcement's called out to a situation, they um, arrive and they assess that this person has low-level drug offenses or those um, those nuisance crimes, mm -hmm. and um, are directed to lead that way. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. So, uh, just in closing, I I, I want to just recognize a couple of people in this process, just so that you understand who, uh, who who's involved. Uh, Mark Friedman, to start with, really spearheaded this idea from the BHO side. Uh, it was really his creation to come up with this idea of a mobile outreach unit and to use that <laughs> as the engagement, the connection point, if you will, between criminal justice and behavioral health. Uh, uh, Linda Kleingarten, who is a local uh, consultant, offered to be a project manager for the development of this for this for the county at no cost to the county uh, and uh, really took us from beginning to end in terms of developing the protocol and the process uh, for this. Uh, a, really a remarkable contribution in, on her part um, and she deserves a, a world of credit for that. The other stakeholders involved, my office, Ann Larson, who's been managing the project now uh, for startup and will uh, keep, be keeping an eye on it as it moves on. Um, Public Defender's Office, the Thurston County Sheriff's Office, and Lacey Police. Uh, this is being piloted right now uh, with the Thurston County Sheriff's Office and the Lacey Police Department. And then hopefully as the program gets its feet under it and we have located any bugs that might exist and dealt with those, uh, we'll be asking other police departments to join, specifically Olympia, Tum and Tumwater has already expressed interest. And uh, in fact, the city of Yelm has expressed significant interest in being involved in this as well. So uh, we're hoping eventually this is a countywide uh, program. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or... No, but I wanna thank you for your leadership in putting this all together and uh, everything takes a lightning rod. You're it, thank you. Thank you. And you do it with credibility. I mean, you really do, because it's authentic. Uh, you mentioned the Mark Friedman with the BHO, and I just wanna tell everybody, everybody know that is the Behavioral Health Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the Mark Friedmans and the Linda Klangartens and the uh, Ann Larsons, thank you very much. Uh, but what you mentioned early on was the, the is typically, not always, but typically the low level of the nuisance crimes. And the nuisance crimes, my experience has been, they're repeated generally by the same individual. Uh, that's what makes it a nuisance. So what people don't generally recognize or realize how many, with the ripple effect, how many people are involved when you take someone off of that spinning wheel, that merry-go-round, how many systems and people are involved with that. For example, the public that witnessed this crime, if it doesn't happen again, they're, they're positively impacted. First responders are generally impacted immediately, and that I'm talking about not just law enforcement, but sometimes uh, uh, a medic call or a, uh, a medic is called to the scene as well to tend to someone, depending on the need. They're impacted in a positive way because they don't need to respond anymore. No report writing if someone's not arrested. Uh, so records, bureaus in different departments, the jails are positively impacted. The courts are impacted positively, but not jamming up the courts, the public defender's office and uh, the prosecuting attorney's office. And every time this is repeated, there's repeated benefits. Every time you have a 50% re, reduction in recidivism, that replicates itself. And, this, and you're restoring the individual who's been the target of that or has, con uh, I guess, caused this thing to begin with, with the nuisance, he or she is positively impacted if they're not re uh, repeating themselves, repeating the crime. So it's got a, it's got a huge effect f monetarily, but also people-wise, all the way through the system. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. It's a, it's a win-win all the way around. And I think in the long run, what we're going to find out is that it actually – uh, has a significant return on investment. So the little bit of investment uh, that it took to get this going and to fund the BHO side of this and so forth, 
the ultimate return in savings, uh, I think, will be substantial. But like any investment, it takes a little while to, to actually realize that. And I look forward to Olympia Police Department and Tumwater and eventually Yelm kick it off um, to get involved in it as well. In Dakota? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I have Thank two you, questions for you. Thank you sir. <laughs> I want to talk about your the bugs you were mentioning there a second ago, and, right? And kinks in the system, so to speak, right? Um, and I'm going to put you on the spot for a second, but you'll know what I'm talking about in terms of the um, training that the law enforcement uh, has needed, or some are very good at it, but just kind of reiterate or reestablish the training program for law enforcement with that outreach program, mental health specialists on the ground there, as you said, had discussion and direction. Um, do you, can you speak to that and how that's had to um, kind of facilitate the operation better in terms of training the lo local uh, law enforcement yeah, agencies? Yeah, I think, and uh, mm -hmm. let m make sure that I'm answering your question, but, and I'm going to mention a couple of, a kind of an evolution of training that's been happening with law enforcement, one of which Commissioner Hutchins is very familiar with. Yeah, so, no, that's why I picked uh, it. law enforcement, uh, you know, really has been looking at how it trains its officers uh, in dealing with people in crisis for many, many years. Thurston County, frankly, uh, was a leader in that aspect, and Commissioner uh, Hutchins, when he was a police officer with Olympia, was one of the leaders in, in not only in this county, but in the state and really in the country mm -hmm. in that regard. So I feel actually very good about how our law enforcement officers are trained in terms of how they respond to and how they react to and how they deal with folks who are experiencing crisis. Uh, now with LEAD, uh, what we've done is we've created a, tr a training program. It's not really lengthy because really we're just training in terms of the process and how it works, ah. uh, but just to make sure that they understand what the protocol is. We've created that in a way where we can do that really in a shift briefing uh, so that we can get out there. And right now, Lacey and Thurston County have all been uh, the officers have all been trained in this. So at that, the officer can I, and correct me if I'm using the wrong terminology. The officer on the ground can make this decision. Does it have to go through the second officer or the third officer or supervisor or this whole bureaucratic vertical uh, approval process? Is kind of that person on the ground that can make it? It's a it's a ground level decision, mm -hmm. but I if, but I want to stress that each department has the ability to create its own protocol, okay. so internally. Mm -hmm. And many departments will require a sergeant's uh, sign off, just like they would any other case or any report, yeah, which is still a street level decision. It's mm -hmm. just making sure that there's uh, a, a supervisor that's also um, supporting or endorsing that decision. Sure, and staying to the theme from a discussion to direction, are you able to talk a little bit about the triage center when our, uh, law enforcement now has a place to go to be able to uh, sure. to um, facilitate the, the yeah. process more and just what that uh, asset that's been too? Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, again, uh, if we're going to really look at the heart of criminal justice reform, what we're talking about is connecting systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in another aspect, so uh, if law enforcement were to contact somebody uh, who really is um, at such a level of crisis that they're a danger to themselves or others, um, they're not going to be a lead participant. We're, we're not going to have some turn somebody over to a case manager who's actively in crisis and a danger to themselves or others. That's where the triage center comes in. So a law enforcement officer who has uh, made an arrest or taken somebody into custody, maybe for their own safety, uh, and needs to have that uh, person admitted to an observational facility to determine if they should be uh, committed um, or, you know, what, I guess what we call um, involuntary treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, that They go to triage. The beauty of the triage is it is... Um, a, a, a place where law enforcement can go and basically, again, just turn the person over to the, into the mental health system mm -hmm. without bureaucracy or paperwork or whatever. Um, and mm -hmm. triage, if, if it's working effectively, will just take that person in and automatically begin that process of determining whether they should yeah. be involuntarily treated and or committed. Perfect. Is that... Answer your question, Commissioner. Brilliant. Thank you so okay. much. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? No. Thank you. All righty, sir. Thank you so okay. much for your time and your explanation of lead here in Thurston County. Right. Thank you for your time. I appreciate exactly. it.
Okay, moving on to the next item on the agenda, we have Art Starry, who's going to kind of uh, give us uh, update on the Henderson Inlet community efforts of water quality. You got to do a PowerPoint. Do you have a map? <laughs> you have a colored map. A colored map. Yeah. That's what I say. Make Bud happy. Bring a map. Ta-da! So what we have. So thank you. Um, so I'm Art Starry. I'm the Environmental Health Division Director for Thurston County, and here with me today is Scott Colliard who's with the State Department of Ecology. Hey, and what we're going to do is, uh, or Scott's mostly going to do this, okay. is uh, share with you a story about um, an evaluation of water quality trends in Henderson Inlet and uh, to see whether or not a lot of the work that's been taking place within that watershed is making a difference. And just as a way of introduction, many of you know that there's been water quality issues in Henderson Inlet for a long time. Um, I probably told you before, when I got hired in 1983, it was to deal with water quality issues in Henderson Inlet and dealing with septic systems. And over the time, over the course of the years, and even going back to before 1983, the community, you know, the county, the health department, the cities, uh, different community members have been working hard to make and making in big investments to try to uh, turn the trend on water quality within Henderson Inlet. And a few years ago, and Scott will provide more details, I think, through the story map, uh, there was a study that was done to evaluate the effectiveness of all this work, and uh, I made a copy of the front page. But anyways, it was an effect, this, a copy, this report, here's the cover page. Um, Henderson Inlet Fecal Coal for Maximum Daily Load, Water Quality Effectiveness Monitoring Report, and Scott's one of the authors for that. And what they found, I think, was very interesting and something that the community would be interested in, and it helps answer the question about all this work, all this money that's being spent, is it making a difference, are we, are we making a difference as far as improving water quality and helping protect public health within the watershed. So without further introduction, I'll, turn, I'll bring Scott up here, if he's willing. I guess and, I'm <laughs> and, here. Um, I don't know quite how we want to run this. I can try to run the slide. You know, I think it might be easier if I run it. Okay, so, so Scott, this is, yeah. So Scott's, uh, again, with the State Department of Ecology, uh, the author of the, the study, and the, per the person, kind of the, the brains behind the story map. So I'll stand off to the side. I don't know if that's good or bad. Yeah, uh -huh. it, this the story maps are a different way that we're trying to present okay. data and information to the public, and it's they're a little bit... Uh, more interactive, so bear with me if I We're barren, no skip problem. through some things. Um, and we would appreciate any feedback also because this uh, is we're not hopefully shy. the first of many story maps oh, that we're going to come up okay. with. Um, so basically, I'll start off by scrolling to this map. Oh, it's interactive. Which you guys all wow. seem to like. Of course, um, the internet's going down. Yeah. And this is basically a layout of the water bodies within Henderson Inlet. Um, the, the unique thing about Henderson Inlet is that a lot of these streams originate uh, in the uplands within urban areas um, and are flowing down through um, uh, non-urban areas into, into the uh, Henderson Inlet itself. Um, a large part of the watershed um, is within the city of uh, Lacey and Olympia, um, as well as uh, Thurston County as a whole. Uh, one of the unique characteristics about Henderson Inlet and the waterways within Henderson um, are the natural resources. Um, many of the, the water bodies within Henderson have sustainable uh, populations of salmon. Um, Woodland Creek, um, especially, which is one of the main streams that runs runs into Henderson Inlet. Uh, Henderson Inlet is also a productive shellfish harvesting area uh, and produces thousands of pounds of uh, clams and oysters a annually. Um, the Henderson uh, Inlet Community Shellfish Farm uh, basically allows people to uh, purchase sh shares of um, um, of shellfish um, within the, the inlet. So as Art said, uh, back in the day, uh, a lot of the shellfish areas were, were uh, threatened by very high levels of fecal coliform bacteria. Um, one of the things that ecology had, 
had done as part of their mandate with the, um, the Clean Water Act is go in and make an assessment uh, and try to f identify where the fecal and other, and other things were coming from and also come up with a plan uh, for folks to follow to try to improve water quality throughout the, um, throughout the watershed. Uh, some of the things that they identified included um, uh, human waste from leaky septic systems, um, uh, manure from, from uh, farms within the watershed, and also stormwater. These were all identified as major sources of uh, bacteria. Uh, of course, these issues with the bacteria end up leading to uh, closures of shellfish areas as well as um, uh, beach clo closures um, within the area. Uh, this map here, if you look at the areas in red, these were the original um, areas that were listed for fecal coliform um, bacteria. And you can see a lot of them originated in the upper watershed, but we also had quite a few um, issues in the, um, in the less populated areas. Um, and again, the, the, the issues really depend on what the, what the sources are. The, the uh, um, main problem um, in, the, uh, in, in the upper watershed were related to stormwater. Uh, the other problems with the county related more to septic issue and also animal access um, issues. So again, I mentioned the Department of Ecology and um, as well as the, the Shellfish Protection District and DOH and a bunch of other partners uh, got together and tried to come up with an implementation plan to reduce fecal. Um, there were a number of different projects that were, were done within the watershed. Um, this map kind of gives you an overview of the different types of projects. Um, they weren't limited to just one or two different things. There were a, a number of things that were done to try to improve people. Okay. So Scott, what's the two dots in the middle? Or what the? So I'll get to that. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah, bet. Um, one, of the, one of the, and this is, this is sort of a, di a, a different approach that we use to assess um, effectiveness of these projects is we included things that were also done to restore salmon within the watershed. Because one of the things that we've, we've learned um, through the years that, that these, a lot of these projects ends up having net benefit both to water quality and well as salmon restoration. Um, and I'll, I'll go through some of these slides, but initially the first slide here just shows um, uh, some location of some fish passage projects. And generally you wouldn't think that fish passage projects would reduce fecal, but in reality when you, when you um, open up a stream and remove these culverts, you're also reducing sediment, which can carry bacteria um, as well as other nutrients. So here's some before after pictures um, of some of the fish passage projects. We also have uh, wetland restoration and riparian uh, projects that were done in the watershed. These wetland areas provide buffers um, for water that's running off the land. Uh, going in through these wetlands, it's sort of filtering the water before they enter uh, back into the waterway. Um, we also have um, some pretty, pretty large conservation areas, um, which were basically to protect some sensitive areas such as wetland or wildlife habitat or even um, um, some shoreline habitat. And so basically what you're doing is you're just removing the human footprint away from um, the nearby waterways and leaving it for, for um, wildlife. Um, one of the other big projects, and this is one of the things that was identified in the regional, regional TMDL, was the connection of the Woodland Creek Estates um, subdivision, um, basically removing, uh, getting the folks off of sec septic systems and uh, connected into the sanitary sewer line. Um, the, and I believe, I think it was 50 or 60 septic systems that were in a relatively small um, area that were really close to Woodland Creek. 
128. Okay. That's. It just comes out, huh? Uh, and and uh, another also important aspect of, of of keeping streams clean is basic education and out, outreach, um, providing places for people to put pet waste when they're walking their dogs, um, informing people how to take care of their riparian areas if they live along a waterway and whatnot. Um, the other major um, contributor of, of both fecal and nutrients to the, the watershed that was identified was stormwater infrastructures. Um, basically, these, these um, stormwater areas here that are these catchment areas and are in gray, uh, in gray are basically catching all the water that, <clears throat> that falls into these areas and they're funneling them directly to the creek. Um, one of the things that, that they've done and are doing actively is trying to catch this runoff before it makes it into the creek and, and treat it um, to reduce the fecal levels and the nutrient levels. And so we had a number of stormwater infrastructure projects that were done within the watershed, at least in the up, upper, upper areas. Um, and then to deal with the non-point issues, um, uh, the, Thurston, or the Thurston Conservation Districts works fairly actively with, with um, agricultural landowners in the watershed to help them reduce their, their footprint um, and reduce their waste uh, from, from livestock and whatnot into the watershed. Um, this is sort of a striking map that, <clears throat> that this basically is the locations of all the septic, septic systems in the watershed. Um, and so there are approximately 6,684 uh, sept septic systems in the Henderson Inlet watershed um, that treat 1.5 million gallons of septic water per day. Um, and so it, the Thurston County's septic program um, basically is ensuring that these septic systems are, are working properly and not contributing to the contamination, not only surface water, but also ground, groundwater. Um, and there are another num number of things other than um, fecal um, that can t they could come out of septic systems. Uh, so one of the things that we do is um, after a certain period of time, we go back into the watershed, we re-monitor um, we try to catalog everything that was done over over the um, lifespan of the the TMDL or the the water cleanup project, and we get a snapshot of what where we're at now. Um, one of the one of the interesting things that came out of this was that we were able to show um, statistically significant improvement or decline in not only fecal coliform but also nutrients that were, were entering into Henderson Inlet from the water, uh, the streams within the, in the uh, watershed. And one of, the, one of the reasons why I get excited about that is because I've been doing this job for a long time in multiple different states, and this is really the f one of the first um, instances where we have seen this kind of improvement in a watershed, not only see this kind of improvement, but also to be able to link it to projects that were done in the watershed. Um, and it's so this is actually very rare and very special, I think, and that's one of the reasons why I'm still here. We, because generally we move on to other projects after we're done, um, but um, the results were so uh, exciting that I've kind of been Calm uh, <laughs> on top. <laughs> yeah. But so, it's exciting. It is very good news. It, it is good news. And one of the other th things, I, if you look at this top graph here, this basically what we did is we tried to we tried to come up with a, um, a couple different ways to look at whether or not things work. One was by looking at um, um, 
what we call best management practice area. Um, and that basically describes the amount of, um, uh, the amount of uh, work that was done to restore water quality. And then what we did was we compared it with the, the trend over time with, with um, fecal coliform in this case. And if you take a look at this, this is, this is basically when uh, a lot of the implementation started. Um, and I think that says 19, it's around 2000, but you can basically see this is a, the red line represents <coughs> the fecal coliform trends. You can see that the trends started reversing um, basically when, we, when folks started implementing different um, practices. And not only that, but we saw this reduction in spite of an increase in population within the watershed, which is also, I think, pretty amazing Great. Um, news. So now and then, if you look at it in the context of, of, of the shellfish area that was um, closed before as opposed to now, you can see uh, this area in green. That's basically. the map I was looking for. That's what you want. What's that? That's the map we're looking for. That's the map you're looking for, yes. So this is the, the area in green represents um, open shellfish areas. Uh, yellow represents threatened areas that are threatened uh, for shellfish production. And then red means it's closed. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, one more question. Scott, uh, when you say red means closed, about in the middle of the green off to the left there, there's some red, but isn't that area that's some kind of a different designation? Yeah, and I think you... Yeah, so um, I'm Jean Snyder, I'm with the Washington State Department of Health and their shellfish program, and to answer your question, um, we... Come to the podium, please. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, we we asked, um, so that designation was put there because of um, conservation with uh, Fish and Wildlife and DNR, and per your request, we actually asked them and worked with them to make that a gray color, which basically means that harvest is not allowed, but it doesn't show up as like a red pollution blob. It's kind of a gray color now. That just means that we don't have a lot of information about the pollution, and it's closed for reasons other than bacteria pollution. I, I guess the only reason I ask, it makes it look like we've failed in a certain no, area. Yeah. And are you, is that gonna be adjusted so the public yeah, does I, know? In fact, I will, yeah, I can adjust that color as soon as I'm done talking. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll ask you then, are you gonna be here for a public hearing at about 5.30? Uh, yes. Oh, okay, good. You okay. might mention it there. Huh? Yeah, I, a matter of fact, yeah, you can change the, the anything in the ma in the map or the presentation within okay. minutes. And a, another thing I want to might want to mention this this story map is public, um, so we've actually published it and it's available to anybody uh, to look at. Okay, um, great. Um, okay, so this is before, um, and the, again, the yellow areas are conditionally approved. Red areas are prohibitive with the ex exception of the, the um, uh, conservation area. Um, and this is what it looks like. I believe it still looks like this now, yes. correct? Like and so it's, it's actually, I know there's been some discussion about um, whether or not it was gonna switch back and forth, but it appears to be holding as open. So I think that was, uh, and I'm not exactly sure how many acres that was. It, it, was a, it was a substantial amount. It looks like a small area on the map, but it was a fairly large area that was open. Um, uh, so basically, this is, this, this is an overview, uh, sort of breaking up the watershed into different areas. Um, the green area here basically says this, this is where we saw the, the largest decrease in both fecal and nutrients. This happens to be the area that where we implemented the most best management practices, and it's also the area that the most amount of money was spent in. Uh, Orange is uh, Woodard Creek. It's, it's, it's a little bit smaller, has less of a contribution to Henderson Inlet. Um, and we saw a, 
Um, we still saw improvement, but it wasn't as great as we saw in Woodland Creek. And lastly, the yellow area basically represents streams that are flowing directly into Henderson Inlet. They're smaller tributary streams. Um, most of the issues are either non-point or uh, domestic animal. Um, this is where the least amount of investment was made, and this is where we saw the least amount of improvement. Uh, so again, the hard work is paid off, but we still have more to go. Um, again, the, the area keeps expanding. We keep getting more and more folks moving into the into the watershed. Um, this is the final map. So that this is bas basically showing where within the watershed we were able to move um, the fecal coliform uh, listings. This is basically represents the water bodies that were impaired. Um, whoops. We still see these in the red. So although we did see significant improvement, we're still not meeting water quality standards and there's still a danger that things could get worse, especially if we back off on some of the things that we've been doing. Um, this area up here in Olympia, the, in the upper Woodard Creek was one of the areas that we were able to um, remove from this list, this, this list of uh, impaired water bodies in, in Washington. And that's all I have. All righty. Thank you so much, sir. It was very informative, and um, congratulations on the success, success for what you and Art and the rest of everybody have been doing. Yeah. It's made a world of difference in our community. And that, I mean, it, it had very little to do with me other than we just happened to be able to measure the success of what others have done. Sure. Um, and I think that's, not, it's not only important for the Henderson, but it's also important for other, um, other cities and counties outside of Thurston because uh, to me this serves as a really good roadmap um, that people can follow to sure. improve water quality in their areas. Thank you so much again. You bet. Yep. Along those lines, I just wanted to ask if you're going to present it at a statewide conference or a national conference. Um, so I've actually presented it at a couple different places. We had a, there was a conference, it was actually more focused around stormwater, but this was in, Thirst, um, in Yakima. Um, and then we've given a couple of presentations internally at Ecology to another number of people. But we've, we've had a lot of inquiries um, and a lot of follow-up that we've directed back to the county. Yeah, I'm talk about All righty. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. Uh, okay, Art, I'm going to bump Art, I'm going to bump you, and I'm going to bring up Sue next. So we'll, okay. I got to get through Sue. Come on up, Sue. Yep, we're going to talk about public health emergency preparedness and response. And Ms. Sue Pointer is going to take Good us through this. Food. You bet. Commissioner Blake Edwards yeah, and Hutchins. I go mm -hmm. in alpha order there, so no, there's no favoritism. <laughs> That's good. So it's it's alphabetical sure. by age. Um, again, I'm... <laughs> I'm Sue Pointer and I manage the Emergency Preparedness and Response Program at Thurston County Public Health and I brought up uh, one of my amazing staff. I have the really good fortune of yeah, she is having awesome. some quite amazing mm -hmm. staff. Jennifer Dixon's going to help out a Yay, little bit with Jennifer. that too. And, um, she knows all the technology components for me. <laughs> Get me through it though. Um, okay, so I'm hearing a lot. Everything I've heard thus far is talking about partnerships and coordination. And it's success, whether it's the LEAD program or whether it's uh, Gretchen's program for NFP and those partnerships. And, and I'm just going to tell you one of the things that, or many of the things that we've been working on in the emergency preparedness and response is about partnerships. Um, I do want to focus in a little about today a partnerships, coordination, and emergency readiness. Um, we've been doing a tremendous amount of... <laughs> We've been doing a tremendous amount of work the last few months, and we've started um, what we call our new program period. We, we do receive some federal funding, and, and we started July 1st. And it's really about kind of setting up our, our department and our partners' readiness to be able to respond. And in the sheer fact of all the disasters and emergencies we've had over the last 6 to 8, 12 weeks here, has really put some focus on preparedness. It's something that we're uh, constantly doing. Um, one of the things that we just hosted was a region, this comes down to partnership, a region three healthcare coalition. 
And Thurston County Public Health is a lead on that uh, coalition, and it involves um, Lewis, Thurston, Mason, Grace Harbor, and Pacific counties. Yep. <laughs> um, it's inviting all of our partners from the health and medical systems to get together, to come together five times a year. We talk about emergency response planning. We talk about how we would work together if an emergency or when, excuse me, when an emergency or disaster happens. And emergencies we can handle. Disasters usually exceed our capability as, as um, an entity. Um, it's hospitals, public health, critical care, long-term care, outpatient clinics. There's a lot of critical partners. We had 50 people at our meeting last Friday. And again, it's, it's meeting people face-to-face -face before the incident or the emergency happens. Um, the next piece that we've been working on a lot in Thurston County, and we, again, this is our partnership with Thurston County Emergency Management under the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan, the CEMP, We've been working on that chapter, as I call it, as ESF-8, which brings together, again, a coordination situational awareness for all of our health and medical partners in Thurston County. And there's a lot. We have a core group that has been working since January to rewrite this plan. And it's not so much a response plan, but just a situational awareness if something happens. Um, of course, we have the Thurston County Coroner. Gary was there with us, has been Providence St. Pete's Capital Medical Center, Thurston County Medic One is a, a big partner, and of course, Thurston Mason BHO, or Behavioral Health Organization, uh, the Thurston County Emergency Management Partnership, and several fire agencies. So that's some of the work we've been doing in rewriting our plans, and you know, that preparedness cycle, we're gonna continually um, go ahead on that. It's really about g being able to get a handle on um, what would be the situation in the community if one of our hospitals went down, or if. Um, we had some critical care partners, such as long-term care that needed to be evacuated and et cetera. And you can see all of that happening in many of the disasters, whether it was um, the disaster that was happening in Houston um, in having to evacuate a lot of people. So meeting our partners beforehand has been really key piece. I'm gonna now um, turn it over to Jennifer, who's gonna talk a little bit about some uh, focus of what we're doing um, locally but I do want to let you know that I will have a, a little quiz for you that I okay. always give you some challenging questions at <clears> the, the end. They're the smart ones. We'll get them to pass the quiz. Yeah, but I'm turning that over to Jennifer to do Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about our medical reserve course, some of the stuff we've been up to. I know you probably have heard of them before, but the, for other people. The MRC? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, our MRC unit. We have 110 active volunteers at the moment. Um, they're medical and non-medical professionals that volunteer their time. So throughout the year, every year we train, do training activities and exercises and drills to prepare for the um, ability to go out and respond to a disaster or um, public health emergency type situation. So part of what we do to prepare for all of that is um, the community activities. So we go out in the community, do certain activities, and those in turn fill a gap in the community. We get out there working with those partners and building those relationships that are important. But we also have the ability to train and practice our capabilities. So whenever we need them in that emergency situation, we're ready to go. So what we've done this year, a couple of our um, triage and treatment tents that we've set up. We were at the Seattle to Portland bike ride uh, this year, so all day at the Tenino station. We were down there, then we were also at the Washington State Senior Games this year. So throughout those two events, we had 19 MRC volunteers who donated 98 and a half hours of their time, and we served 195 people between the two. So a variety of people just coming in with needing a Band-Aid to people actually needing some treatment um, and other services. So we've done that this year. Our partners through those were the Cascade Bicycle Club, the Washington State Senior Games, and their organization, Thurston County Fire District 12, and then the Tenino High School basketball team. They're right next to us at the Tenino station. So some really good partnerships that we built there. <coughs> <clears throat> then we do our immunization clinics every year, our back to school immunization clinics. And those are to fill a gap in our community for students ages three through 18 
who we offer all the required school um, immunizations for at no cost to them. So it's a, it's a really great opportunity and service to the community, but in turn, our MRC are practicing their ability to stand up a pod, which is the point of dispensing. So if we ever needed to dispense out medications or vaccinations quickly, efficiently, this is their practice on how to do that. So this year, so far, we've had a little, the Little Red Schoolhouse was one of the events that we did. Little Red Schoolhouse is its own organization, but they do a distribution day each year to give families backpacks and school supplies and clothes, things like that. So we partnered with them and did our vaccination clinic at the same time, which was really successful. It was our first year. Then we also did the Tumwater Schools Back to Basics program. So they do one day, they do sports physicals, a different day they do the vaccination clinic. And we worked with them on that program. And we also worked with uh, St. Peter's and during their sports physical clinic offered vaccinations as well. So between all three of those clinics, we've had 52 MRC volunteers donate 229 hours of their time. We had 250 students that came through and that were seen throughout those three clinics and we gave 287 vaccinations. So huge gap that our community had, a lot of kids that are now protected against many diseases and then our MRC, like I said, was able to practice their skills in how to set up a pod and rapidly dispense um, <clears throat> vaccinations if needed. And then still to come, we have our September 23rd clinic at Kaiser Permanente. So um, we'll partner with them. Our other partners throughout these other clinics, which were really important, were was North Thurston School District, Little Red Schoolhouse, Together, Tumwater Public Schools. Choice Regional Health Network and St. Peter Family Practice. And so those are some of our partners that we've built really good relationships with. So we already have those in case they're needed in the future, when they're needed. Um, and these clinics, they're a great opportunity for the MRC to work with and build relationships with those partners. So before the emergency happens, they already know some of those people, how they work, and we can easily fit in and work with them. And being a part of the MRC, it's a great opportunity to be involved in something also prior to an emergency happening. So we vet all of our volunteers prior to, that way when something happens, we can just be ready to go. Whereas if you wait until after the fact, it's a lot harder to take volunteers in and have them help because you don't know their backgrounds. So now we're gonna move on to being prepared for evacuations, which is part of where your quiz is gonna come in. Uh -oh. <laughs> so we have, um, we focused on evacuations just because in light of recent things that have happened. This or says personal prepper. Right? Personal preparedness. Okay, mm -hmm. let's do it. So for you at home, okay. if you had to evacuate your home because of something happening, whether it was flooding or a hurricane or fires. We've had, I mean, that's been very real in our state currently as some people looking at or being prepared for having to evacuate their homes. So what we look at are the P's of preparedness. So all starts with the letter P, so it's somewhat easier to remember. And we have people, so you, your family members, whoever it is that's in your home, even your neighbors, your community. So it can expand outside of more than just you, but uh, people that are important to you. And then your pets. So you don't wanna forget your pets, what you're gonna do with them if you have to leave your home. Uh, papers, so just important documents that you may need. Uh, phone numbers, so phone numbers for out-of-state contacts or your in-state contacts also, but also healthcare providers, those type of important things that you may need if you have to leave your home and you won't be able to go back for a little prolonged period of time. Prescriptions, so that's the P word that goes with it, but that includes all of your medical needs. So if you have eyeglasses, if you have prescriptions that you need, you wanna make sure you have medications, if you have any other equipment, medical type equipment that you or your family members need, you wanna make sure you have that. Uh, if you're evacuating, so pictures, special mementos, things that you really don't wanna leave at home and possibly never get back again. Um, PCs is on there, because computers are a big part of our daily lives nowadays, so that includes cell phones, things of that nature. And then plastic, and that refers to credit cards, but also cash. Cash is really great to have on hand, because sometimes those credit card machines don't work in the event of a disaster. So those are the P's of preparedness, and now if we had to actually evacuate, there's evacuation levels one, two, and three. And so your quiz is, 
Do you guys know what those levels are, what they mean? One, two, and three. <laughs> do you know what they mean? <laughs> so level one, do, do any of you know what a level one evacuation means? You guys too. Forgot pillow. Alert, huh? yeah. <laughs> waiting for pillow. So level one <laughs> is to be alert. So you what want to alert, be alert, alert of a potential yeah. evacuation. So something is going on that's maybe nearby. You need to start thinking about all these P items and do I have that stuff ready to go? Should I be preparing it? So just being alert, being aware. Level two, oh, I'm sorry, I was supposed to ask you, but I put it up there. That's all right. uh, <laughs> level two is to be ready. So you want to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. So the <laughs> situation is looking a little more serious. You want to make sure you have all those P items ready to go. And can anyone guess what level three might be? Oh, yeah, good job. Good job. Do it. So level three is you want to go. So it's time to evacuate, be gone. All those P items should be ready to go, take with you, and be on your way so you can be safe. So there's a little graphic uh, okay. of what those are. But yeah, so that's all I have, unless you guys have questions. I thought you were going to stump Gary there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah. The uh, September 23rd clinic at Kaiser Permanente. Mm -hmm. Will you give us more information and, and location? So yeah, so watching it uh, at home. Yeah, Kaiser. Um, it's from nine to eleven or nine to noon. So nine a.m. to noon, Saturday, September twenty-third. Kaiser is. I forget the address. It's on Lily. Yeah, it's on Lily Road. Five hundred, six hundred block of Lily. Yeah. Northeast. Yes. Yes, northeast. Yeah, just across the street from St. Yep. Pete's main entrance. Mm -hmm. A little bit north. Yeah, and we're right in the main the main right. entrance. So the main entrance door is where you would go in to come to the clinic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Do you coordinate some with Kurt Harden's group? We work with them, yeah, um, on, on certain things and projects. Yeah, definitely. Can, can you maybe mention to the folks out there how that is a just works together. I mean, yeah. Kind of um, well, like Sue mentioned earlier, our ESF-8, so Essential Support Function 8, that's the health and medical side. Um, so we work with them on a lot of that and the coordination between those two. Um, we work with them on our MRC as well. So whenever we do an event, we get like the mission numbers, things like that from our emergency management department. So with our volunteer base, we work with them quite a bit. Um, we also have... Uh, Quick example is our Summit Lake response, yeah. and where it's there critical for mm. us as a health department, we stood up a response, but we needed resources. And what emergency management does in Thurston County is is provide, or they don't provide them, excuse me, they make the contact and get the resources. So there were additional things that we needed um, specific to testing and providing water and et cetera for residents. So they're, they're an integral partner um, in that coordination for just about everything. Thank you. I, I've talked with them before about um, if there's outpatient medical clinics and they lose power, um, might they be able to help us uh, get a generator that would to keep vaccines cool? I mean, that's an example. Absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to connect those two. What a great spokesperson and cheerleader. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so, Sue, do you have a pop quiz also? No. Oh, good. I'm really. Can you give us a pop quiz? No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, we no, worked no. on this really hard. We had to. We thought okay. we were gonna. You you forget <laughs> this is live TV. We don't get retakes, so we want to get it right. <laughs> That's right. <you> know? <laughs> we want to get extra credit where we can. Be ready. Be ready. Okay. Be ready. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So I'm going to ask uh, the next person on the agenda is uh, for developmental disability disabilities for high school transition, and that's Jennifer Popchak Hakim. I think I might have got it right that time. Come up and talk to us a little bit about that. All right. Hello, everybody. I know. <laughs> no, nobody's nobody's staring at you. It's okay. <laughs> there you go. Good to see you again. Yes, nice you to hit see the big you. Button? Big it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she can't do that. <laughs> you got it. Bam! There you go. 
you're in. Okay, so I'm Jennifer Popchak Hakim with Developmental Disabilities, and I'm, it's, it's September, and all the young folks are going back to school, so it's a great time to talk a little bit about um, a service that, that we're very involved with, and that's high school transition. Um, so not everybody knows, but um, individuals with developmental disabilities, when they're in high school, they're able to stay till the age of 21. And um, part of this is uh, developing skills and building skills. And a big piece of that extra time in high school is to prepare folks for transitioning out and getting jobs. So, oops. There we go. So high school transition services, what, what are they? And, and basically, um, that's the broader term for any activities that um, for these individuals from, you know, 18 to 21 that are, that take place in high school so that they can get out and get a job afterward. So school to work is a little bit more um, narrow and that's a specific program, and we're one of seven counties that participate in the School to Work program. And um, that specific program is uh, in conjunction with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. So we partner with them and we co-fund the School to Work program. And it's been one of the highly successful programs in uh, the state for high school transition, and that's why the seven, seven of the big major counties participate in this. And um, it has, it, it's distinguished from um, kind of the, the broader scope of high school transition with some specific outcomes, the dual funding with the Division of Vocational Rehab, and uh, the clearly delineated partnership roles with the school uh, vocational rehab and the county um, there. So one of the big factors that we've found with School to Work that um, really uh, has increased our success is connecting with folks early. And that can be prior to that last year of high school. And last year of high school is going to be 2021. <coughs> So we found that going out, getting to know the, the kids before their last year of high school, getting to know the families, connecting with the teachers, going to some of those uh, educational planning meetings, those have been great opportunities for us to get to know the folks and um, to uh, some of the paperwork pieces, like the uh, developmental disabilities application, social security application, those take a very long time and they can be really cumbersome. So getting them done early not only allows us to get to know the individuals, but get some of those paperwork pieces out of the way. Another thing that, that we do is kind of work with families on uh, promoting uh, transferable skills with their kids. So kind of bringing them in as partners. Uh, maybe they can work with their student on setting an alarm, getting up on time, uh, making up a schedule, sticking to that schedule, basically getting getting them involved in um, learning more skills for for uh, that'll be transferable to work. So we get we get referrals for kids in the school to work <laughs> program. We accept applications, and typically we um, get those applications out in May and get them returned to us in June. However, uh, I think it's kind of a cool thing about our program. We accept those applications throughout the year, open, continuous, all the time. And we just kind of, you know, have a real flexible thing going with the school and the providers. And we just were able to bring students in at any time during the year. So I think that's, that's kind of a really important thing about our program. Um, but schools are great referral sources. Some of our community partners and families, we've gotten calls directly from families or students, you know, to the county um, for, for uh, students that want to participate in school to work. 
So School to Work actually has four main pieces that are really simple. Intake and exploration are the first two. Intake has to do with all the paperwork. So that's just the agency, uh, voc rehab, and us out there uh, making sure the individuals get all the paperwork put in place. Then the exploration piece, and that's where um, the work really begins, and that's, um, and that's why this is, uh, the school to work model is a very collaborative model, and um, it's, it's kind of exciting for us in the sense that we really get to partner with all these different, different folks and get all these perspectives as we sit down with these families and students and talk about what are your goals, what are your career goals, what do you wanna do, what are your strengths, what are your challenges, and really the exploration piece is getting to know this person so that we can um, facilitate getting them out and getting a job. So the second two pieces are internships and getting that job. Internships are typically four to six weeks and a, a lot of the agencies that we work, for, work with have internship sites kind of developed, but they're constantly developing new internship sites. So one of these school to work students will go uh, have an internship and in that exploration process, they'll talk a lot about um, what kind of site would this person want to have an internship in, what kind of skills do they want to work on. So it's, it's really tailored to the individual. Then they go out, spend four to six weeks in that internship and then there's a meeting between DVR, county and uh, the individual and their families and we talk about you know, what was learned? Did this person really want to work in that career? Did they, you know, did, do they have something else in mind? And um, so we talk about, are there, were there challenges that we thought of initially? Were those really challenges? Were there strengths that we've seen now that we didn't see before? So we really talk about what did, this in, what did we learn from this internship and what can we carry to um, forward in getting this person a job? These are the three agencies that we currently work with. VADIS is kind of a new agency that we brought in, and all three of these agencies will work in either county. Morningside's typically been Thurston County, EFI's typically been Mason County, but they all three will um, work with folks in any of the counties. So we're really excited that we have these three great agencies to work with. They've really been wonderful. Jennifer, yep. could you just, the, Go back to that on Vitus sure. and the exceptional foresters. I, sure. I know about Morningside, but could you just little tiny bit sure. about each one sure. of those? Sure, sure. Exceptional ones? foresters is, is an agency that started up in Mason County, and they actually have an interesting story about um, a group of folks with developmental disabilities actually working as like loggers in the forest, and that's how they got their name, exceptional foresters. And then it grew into this, you know, kind of different kind of business, but they kept the name. And they actually do a lot of employment supports for us in Thurston County. And they also work with some folks in Yelm and Mason County. So they're, all these agencies are kind of cross county, but predominantly they're in Mason. Morningside's a big uh, Thurston County agency and they've yeah. got most of our individuals that we work with here in Thurston. VADIS has been an agency that we brought down from Sumner they do a lot of work in Pierce County and Sumner, and, and I've been working with the Pierce County coordinator um, uh, in, in trying to um, help Vadis kind of grow in, in Thurston, Mason County. And uh, they've been a really exciting agency <coughs> up in, in Pierce County. So I think they'll do some great things for us. They have a real strong tradition in high school transition. So. And so I just want to recap for you guys. Um, and one thing I'd like to say that I didn't really talk much about, but in going out to these high school transition fairs and talking to students and families, it's, it's been um, striking to me how often you hear um, students talk about the positive impacts of leaving high school and being able to get a job and families talking about oh, I didn't think my son or daughter would, would have this kind of a life after they graduated high school. And, and so there's this really um, positive self-worth mm -hmm. that, that we continually hear. And, and I think about that all the time in doing this work, that you know we're getting these kids out 
and getting them jobs in a community and they're contributing members they feel good about themselves families you know see their independence and it's a really it's it's a wonderful thing to be engaged in so um, just the key takeaways we continually accept the applications anybody can turn it in at any time I think that's a big um, piece of uh, for us starting early is the key getting in and and either getting in touch with the county or the county getting in touch with individuals that's the early start is is a huge success choice of providers we have three great providers and and people can kind of move around with all three providers and try out different things and and see what works for them so I think that choice is an important piece and the goal is a job by June that's that's what we're working tor towards and this year we've um, taken on a few more individuals than we've historically taken on so we'll see how we do <coughs> any questions no, I don't have any questions, but thank you for your dedication. Sure. I know you're an employee here at the county, but it, it shows your dedication to the, what you're doing every day. Gotcha. And you make, you make a difference. Thank you. And I love the fact how much you said it. Uh, it impacts positively the, the kids getting the job, giving them self-worth, because we all want affection, belonging, and recognition. Everybody exactly. wants that. Exactly. And this is way cool for them. Yeah, it is thank a great you. program. Yeah, I like to echo what Gary's saying. The one with the dedication, but I can see the passion in what you do and yeah. how you take care of kids, and that's absolutely <coughs> marvelous. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. All right. So, Art, if you can just do me a favor and for one minute talk about Septic Week. Hey, um, I'll be real quick. Yes. And there's actually someone else here from the state who's going to talk a little bit about Septic Smart Week. I got one minute. Okay, you got one minute, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yes, uh, if I can get the, <laughs> 50 seconds now. Oh, you can have your minute here. Yeah. Right. I got two more people to get in. So. All right. Uh, EPA started uh, Septic Smart Week. Up. So please introduce yourself, please. Yeah. Sorry. I'm Jeremy Simmons from Washington State Department of Health. I'm the wastewater management section manager. Yeah, thank you. Um, so EPA uh, started up uh, Septic Smart Week about three, four years ago, um, four years ago. and. Um, Basically, what they do is they've developed the brand, they've developed some outreach material. The entire uh, Septic Smart Week is basically um, to educate septic owners on proper operation and maintenance of septic systems. Um, so that's EPA's role. DOH, we've uh, sort of Washingtonized the brand a little bit. We've developed some messages, some material. We, um, we see ourselves in a supportive role for the counties. We've developed some graphics and some uh, some material for use on the web, for billboards, for outdoor advertising, for social media. Um, this year, our big focus is on social media and promoting the regional septic loan program. It's a partnership I think you mm -hmm. folks got in recently. Um, it's a partnership between us and Ecology and, um, and the counties. Um, so I guess I would just close by saying that it's a really important program by um, because what it does is it, it uses the way people communicate now to educate them in non-technical, simple to understand terms about why, why it's important to maintain their investment and protect their community and water quality. That's it. Okay, and how long have you been doing it? We've, we, we've gotten uh, governor's proclamations the last three years. Okay, yeah. um, so that's how long Washington's been active. And what are some of the events as far as Septic Week that you know of that people can go to that are off the top of your head? Is there like well, forums you know, or? I don't know of time? anything that's going on particularly next week. Septic Smart Week is next week. Um, a lot of counties uh, sort of brings, Septic Sam is the mascot. Uh -oh. He's kind of a guy with a clipboard. Um, a, lot of guy, a lot of counties <laughs> bring him out for their, their shellfish events or for their other water quality <laughs> events. Um, I, I guess what I would say is just watch, uh, go to DOH's Twitter feed or go to um, Ecology's Twitter feed, and they'll, they'll be talking about some stuff next week. Sure. Any questions? No, I take it Septic Sam is the opposite of Mr. Floaty, is that right? <laughs> well, yeah, I would say <laughs> opposites, okay. but somehow related. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. they're related. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so you a clipboard. Thank you. <laughs> you got a clipboard. Yeah, clipboard. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I put no, a, it's fine. a slide up that shows some workshops, and we'll also be pushing materials out via social media so sure. in conjunction with the Department of Health. So. 
Excellent you, time management. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. You're so awesome. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Shelley, the Director of Public Health and Social Service for Remarks, and then Dr. Wood. Okay. I want to start by thanking our presenters again today. Um, thanks to Jennifer and her team. Um, my own son has developmental disabilities and benefited from programs mm -hmm. like High School Transition. Uh, and because of supports that he received through programs like that, from agencies like that, um, He's 20 years old, has his first job, is doing great. So um, great work. I'm really proud to have that as part of our department. Yeah. Um, I also want to thank Sue and her team and the Medical Reserve Corps, um, especially for those 300 kids that they worked so hard to give immunizations. Many of those kids um, would not have been able to attend school otherwise, and I had the privilege to get to go to one of those events at Little Red Schoolhouse. It was just amazing to see all the families there, all the kids that were benefiting, even though they were getting shots, they were very happy um, <laughs> to be getting all, um, all of the services and access to health care and other supplies that they needed. And just what a professional and amazing dedicated group of volunteers. So we're really thankful to our Medical Reserve Corps. And also, I just have a tremendous amount of confidence in our team that, as Sue said, when a disaster happens, um, that we will be ready. Uh, earlier this month, you did proclaim September National Preparedness Month. Um, so I just thought that that was a great reminder um, to all of our residents to be prepared, especially in light of all the disasters, natural disasters in our state um, and in Texas and Florida. And our hearts are with um, everyone in our country that's been struggling with that. And we want to be ready here in Thurston County. And um, the LEAD project also, I just wanted to comment on that. Um, it's an amazing project. Um, it's not only saving our public money, but I just felt it was really poignant to be on our agenda today with our National Recovery Month proclamation that you just made, because that's really helping people get the services and support that they need that are struggling with things like substance abuse instead of um, going to jail and um, you know further uh, challenging their lives in, in other ways and giving them the help that they need. So tremendous leadership from Thurston Thrives and Prosecutor Thunheim um, and all the partners on that project. And um, to our DOH and um, Department of Ecology guests as well, thank you so much. Um, I'm very proud of uh, the, the efforts, um, all the collaborative efforts between our state, our county, all the jurisdiction, the tribes, everyone in the community, the climate action team that um, has been dedicated to making these improvements happen in the Henderson watershed. And um, we're really excited about even more improvements that we can make. So I hope that people that have managed to stick this um, far through our agenda today uh, will stay for the public hearing right after here at 530, um, where you will hear proposed ordinance to reenact rates for Henderson program. So we have lots of innovative and great work happening. I'll try to speed through it um, in light of time. Um, hate to do that because there's so many exciting things. Uh, but one of those is that we continue to uh, pursue accreditation. So we recently submitted a grant application for accreditation support from the National Association of County and City Health Officials. And so we will, if awarded that grant, we'll be working on quality improvement and performance management um, in preparation for applying to the Public Health Accreditation Board. We also applied um, or submitted a RFQ response to the Cascade Pacific Action Alliance, of which we're members. And we are proposing um, three areas in the Medicaid Transformation Project in which our department um, plans to participate. And that's around opioid response by expanding our syringe exchange program, um, maternal child health by expanding nurse family partnership program in our region, and chronic disease self-management. The Cascade Pacific Action Alliance and Work Group, of which we participate in virtually all of them, will be reviewing the responses and selecting the projects for the Medicaid Demonstration Project application that is due next month in October to the Washington State Healthcare Authority. That will potentially bring $85 million in new Medicaid dollars in our region over the next five years. So we're really excited to be a part of that and see the impact that that will have on our community. So regional collaboration is a focus not only for Cascade Pacific Action Alliance, um, but also for the Department of Health. And it's really changing the way in which we deliver services and work together with our other lo local <coughs> health jurisdictions. You'll be continuing to hear that throughout the year and ongoing, I think, in the future. 
This week, there's a regional meeting of health departments regarding the Tobacco Vaping Prevention Project. Um, that was a grant that we were awarded um, earlier this year, and that will take place this Wednesday, September 13th in Chehalis, and our department's really proud to be the lead grantee in an effort to reduce tobacco and vaping, particularly among yeah. youth populations uh, throughout our seven county region. We, in our environmental health uh, division, we've been very busy uh, responding to many concerns about bats. So many people may have read news um, from King County about an increase in bats with rabies. So <clears throat> we responded um, after that uh, media came out um, to about 15 calls in two days. Um, and we wow. handle lots of bat calls throughout the year. Um, as summer ends, bats often seek shelter in homes and buildings uh, during the day, so that's really common. Calls have increased due to that recent media coverage. And um, just to kind of share with you what that process is like, our staff interview callers to determine if they were exposed to a bat and if they're at risk for rabies. When a, an exposure occurs, um, our staff work with animal control to collect the bats, and we ship them off to the Department of Health lab for testing to see if they have rabies. If the bats do test positive for rabies, then the person's counseled about getting vaccinated. So fortunately, only about 6% of bats um, tested um, are tested positive for rabies. Um, and throughout uh, the state, there's about 300 a year. So um, we send about 12 to 20 each year. Usually only a couple are positive. Um, we're not really sure whether uh, this increase in numbers is because more people are reporting them um, or if there's an actual increase in rabies. So um, if residents do have exposure to a bat, they can call our department at 360-867-2667. So in other environmental health news, uh, we're pleased to report that ongoing weekly Summit Lake water quality testing continues to indicate no dangerous levels of toxic algae. Other lakes in Thurston County are also testing below levels of concern for toxins. Um, Long Lake did have high levels of microcystin, which is a liver toxin, which is different than what was experienced in Summit Lake previously. Um, that was earlier this month, but levels have returned to, sa uh, to safe levels, and people in Long Lake can um, enjoy the rest of the summer, hopefully, um, over at Long Lake and use that for recreation. So we'll continue to do our lake monitoring through October and um, continue to ask residents to notify us if they see toxic algae blooms. Um, throughout the state, uh, there are currently four with toxic algae levels above the guidelines um, in four different counties, all recreational lakes. So we also received many calls this month concerning air quality due to wildfires. We did have several days of poor, poor air quality, but um, as of today, uh, we just checked right before this meeting, the um, Olympic Regional Clean Air Agency, also known as ORCA, um, indicated that our levels here are good. Uh, so, but we know weather is changing, and as the cold weather season approaches, a uh, task force has been <coughs> convened by our Terror Board of Health, Commissioner Blake, representatives from nonprofits, um, all of the cities, faith community representatives, and the county are working together to develop emergency plans to accommodate homeless and vulnerable individuals during the winter season, during the day hours, in the absence of an official warming center this season. That's very unfortunate we don't have that available. Um, but we are making plans to accommodate those populations during severe weather. And um, we're also really happy to have the Providence Community Care Center that recently opened. Um, I was able to attend that wonderful event. Um, really extend my congratulations and appreciation to everybody that has been a partner in making that happen. So the Community Care Center will provide a single point of access for street-dependent individuals needing access to behavioral health, substance abuse, things like housing, laundry, basic needs, um, health care, and other coordinated services um, provided by many organizations together, including Thurston County and the Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization. And that concludes my report. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Shelley. Dr. I'll keep, I'll keep it quick. I wanted to introduce um, Dr. Preston Stevens, mm -hmm. who is um, doing some um, cross-training uh, with me, um, uh, my clinical colleagues, learning what we do here in public health. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for letting me sign those contracts so we have students and residents. To, um, along the lines of baths, if you do have a bat, 
please, um, and you capture it, um, please refrigerate it because uh, after a weekend uh, just uh, decaying, it's not, it, it's not testable. So, and you don't want to smash its head um, because that's the part that needs to be tested. Um, and finally, I just would like to say that um, uh, we are still working on, on a, um, a disease that has plagued mankind um, since ancient times, since the pharaohs walked uh, the planet, and that is tuberculosis, and I'm happy to an answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Wood. No. Thank you, ma'am. Anything else? No. no. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Is there a motion to adjourn? Mr. Chair, move to adjourn the BOH meeting of 9-12-17. Second. The move is second to adjourn. We are adjourned. Thank you.